Good morning, everyone. Uh, what a beautiful morning it is. Uh, once, once again, we're back outside. Uh, it's a beautiful morning here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So just wanted to take advantage of this, uh, of this opportunity to look at God's, God's beauty, you know, the trees and the blue skies, right? And uh, the, the green leaves and this, this are different colors that he has provided for us yet again this morning. He's, he's just a great God and he continues to, to take his finger and, and paint the universe and paint beautiful pictures and landscapes for us that we may be able to enjoy and know that he is the creator, that he is the architect of this entire universe. And he has made all this beauty on behalf of us yet again this morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope all is well with you and your friends and your family. Um, pray that God is continuing to bless you. And if you haven't said thank you uh, to the Lord this morning, this is an opportunity to yet say thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us yet again today. Uh, thank you for, uh, for my younger brother who has just joined. Uh, may God continue to bless him and his family. Um, God just continues to keep blessing him. And, and uh, I just, I just want him to know that, that he is loved. He is loved by, by his entire family. And, uh, and um, just, just know that he's doing a great work as, as a father and as a husband and as a brother. So we want to just say thank you once again, Lord, for you have done so many great things for us yet again today. And I'm excited about this message today. Very excited. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you once again for allowing us to wake up and see another day today, for it's only because of your grace and mercy that we're able to stand. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, because you are, oh, you are a great God, and you are the one that puts uh, breath in our mouths, and you are the one who opened up the curtains this morning and allowed the sunshine to, to come in, and our eyes just popped wide open, and we knew that once again you had a purpose for us again. So we thank you, Lord, for, for food and clothing and shelter. Uh, we want to thank you for a reasonable portion of good health and strength. Thank you for our mental health, Lord. Continue to bless us throughout the rest of this week, but not only our families, but all those that are surrounding us. Every time I lay eyes on an individual, bless that person, Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, I'm going to ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. For the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. What we're going to do is, uh, this is uh, the third part of this, and I, I thought I was just going to just stay in this just one time, just one week to talk about Joseph, but it's impossible to talk about Joseph in one week or in just one, one talk, one sermon. Um, so this is actually part three of A Nation Exposed, A Nation Exposed, okay? And we're going to come out of the book of Genesis, the 39th chapter, and we're looking at just three verses today, verses 7 through 9, Genesis 39 right? Verses 7 through 9. And let's read this uh, uh, in its entirety. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master, what is not what is with me in the house? And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, the first thing that popped into my head when I was doing this research was the, was the word wateth, right? Or wateth, right? In verse 8. And it simply means that, uh, that the master just said, you know what? Here's the keys to the house, right? Here's the code to the alarm system, Okay. Here's where I keep my safe. This is where I keep all my, uh, my personal belongings. All is yours. Everything in my house is yours. Everything. You have responsibility over my entire house. I believe in trusting you so much that the entire house, everything within it, belongs to you. And this is what Joseph is trying to explain to uh, uh, Potiphar's wife, okay? So we're going to back up in a few moments and continue to talk about this story. For it is one that is uh, it's, it's Hollywood worthy, right? It could be uh, something that you would see in the movies, right? I mean, it's something that we do see in the movies all the time. But it is a very unusual story. What has happened as we, as we back up from, from last week, and if you haven't read this text, what has happened is Joseph, uh, he has been, uh, I won't go all the way back, but he is now in Egypt. And he is in charge, he is uh, laid to charge, or he is a servant for Potiphar. Potiphar is the, is the chief warden, per se. He sits under Pharaoh as the one who is over all the entire, all the enti the entire prison system for all of Egypt. So keep that in mind, right? 
that he has allowed this Hebrew, who doesn't even speak the language, right? Doesn't even uh, wear the attire of an, of an Egyptian, but has found grace. And as we've talked about this for the past few weeks, that, that God was with him, that the Lord was with him and blessed him in everything that he did. So it's amazing how, uh, 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 you know, Potiphar looked upon this young man and said, you know what, I just, I just trust him, right? For, for who he is and, and, and what, what I see that he can do. I mean, I just, there's something about him. There's something different, you know, about him that I just trust him, okay? So that's where we're at today. So there are these challenges, right? When we talk about being exposed, there are these, these challenges, okay? Being exposed, that means that you are illustrating to the world that you have vulnerabilities and, and you have weaknesses and nothing wrong with that, but we all have them. And so when you think about a nation exposed or a nation uncovered, uh, continue to put that into context of Israel at this time. Israel doesn't have its three million people yet. That's gonna come much later. We're talking about a handful of people that God is, is, is working with, right? He is shaping, okay? Because for the next hundred years or so after this, this, this nation up under Joseph, under, up under what he has done for this, for this nation, will continue to prosper. But it will prosper, right, under difficult circumstances. They will go into bondage by the millions. So that's where we're at today. So these are the challenges, right, of this nation, a nation exposed, right? How did they get here, okay? So in the context, as we continue to move through the, the pendulum of the Hebrew people, God reveals to us his willingness, right, to protect and preserve his people despite the world moving around them. Yes, yes, Egypt is, is, is growing. Uh, the, the Pharaoh is, is likened. He, he likes Joseph. And uh, there's a lot of great things going on in Egypt. It is a great nation. It's probably one of the most powerful nations in the world at this time. And Joseph is there in the midst of this as a backdrop to this development, this social development that's what's taking place. Good morning, Shelby. So as we look into... Um, uh, chapter 39, verses 7 through 9, do know that this is what's happening. This is the backdrop of what is occurring in this nation, okay? The world is moving around, but yet Joseph is in the background, okay? Because God is working a marvelous work. So ever notice initially how the Word of God is overlooked, right? When we, as we look into the context of this particular story, right? It's not taken serious, okay? Ever notice that those set out to harm you or to discourage you only want one thing, and that is to disturb or disrupt your relationship with God, right? They want to be a, 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 a thorn in your side, right? They don't want to see your happiness, right? They see something they want from you, and they want to take it. And that is what's happening in this story today. Lastly, do know that there are powers that exist that have been created to move against the equilibrium of, pre, of peace and prosperity. But it was, created, it was created to destroy the importance, right, of your position in the kingdom of heaven. Whether small or large, whatever station in life you are, there is something, the wiles of the devil is trying to attack you, right, and distract you and do some type of harm against you because why you were made in the likeness of God. Hmm. So this is what happens in the story today. God's favor is tested. If you want to think about four points, God's favor is tested. Point two, we must find a way to pers uh, persevere in, possible, in uh, difficult circumstances. Point three, we need, to, we need to stand firm and stand true to the word of God. I know this is a lot. And the, the fourth point is Joseph's self-discovery, right? We're learning more about Joseph, right? He is mature now. He's not this little boy who's been protected uh, by his father. You know, he, he, he is not protected anymore. He is, he is there on his own without uh, the cover of his brothers who, who disliked him. They hated him uh, for his favor with his father, right? With his father, Jacob. And so he is there by himself, making a, becoming a man all to himself. And think about this for a moment. As when you think about the, the church context or how we are as Christians, what God is trying to illustrate to us is that we have a personal relationship with him and nobody else. He is in an isolated quarantine situation where, hey, I've got to make it through this situation. If I just only trust in God, he will bring me through this, right? But if he doesn't bring me through it, at least he's going to be with me as I go through it. So that is what's taking place in this story today. And I'm just going to go back and read it again uh, for, for, for our audience that's here right now. 
This is what's happened in this story. And as I stated, it is, it is a made for Hollywood event, right? And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. What has happened is that he is fair. He is an attractive. Scripture says that Joseph is an attractive person. He's an attractive man, right? Verse eight, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master, what is not what is with me in the house? And he had committed all that he hath to my hand, meaning he doesn't care what I do inside the house. He trusts me with everything. If he, if he had a thousand pieces of gold and silver uh, uh, land by the bedside, he knows that Joseph is not gonna touch it. Verse eight, but he refused, to, he refused his master's wife advances, right? And he explains to her, behold, my, my, my master, right? Uh, uh, he has laid everything to my charge, right? Everything except you. How can I do, here's the crutch. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? People just not taking God serious, right? So our story, this is the story of a nation. When you think about Joseph, think about this is a story of a nation before it all went bad, you know, later on in the scriptures. Right? How they started going left and right and started worshiping idols and, and they wanted a king and, and this, 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 kings and princesses, right? But we have Joseph standing firm, right, in the promises of God, even though he is all alone, this Hebrew boy in the land of Egypt, right? And we do know that he was favored by his father, being this child that was loved and appreciated above all his brothers. And he is a young man that receives this favor, not because of where he sits in the birth lineage, right? But because he comes from the woman he desired the most, that Jacob desired the most, right? I, he, he laid eyes on Rachel and he, he worked, with her, worked for her for like 18 or 20 years, okay? And she could not have any children until almost the later part of her life, right? Before she died. And the last two children she had was Joseph. And then she had Benjamin, and she died on the side of the road after having Benjamin. So this is why Jacob uh, takes ownership or he loves these two children the most. I'm sure there are other reasons, but there's something about uh, Rachel. I mean, he, he, he didn't really uh, appreciate Leah, his other wife, his first wife, but there was something about Rachel, okay? This is the one he worked for. She is the one who gave birth to these last two sons of the tribe of Israel. So Jacob finds favor in Joseph and his younger brother, Benjamin. He wants to protect them at all costs, right? Okay. So this is our first character. This is Joseph, as, we, as I gave like an, uh, an outline of who he is. I know we've talked about him for the, for the past few weeks. So our second character in this story today, right, is Potiphar's wife. And we don't know her by name, <laughs> right? But I don't care how many times you read this text, and I've read it several, several times, trust me. What I learn about her, right, as we unpack her character, is that she is a woman of unquestionable, or let's put this, questionable character, okay? She spends a great deal of time alone, right? I'm sure Potiphar is away a lot. He is gone all the time, right? She is desperate to exemplify her love over, the, over those that she has power and authority over, like all these young men and, and these women that are working inside this palace, right? She has power, right? She, whatever they say, you know, you go and they go and come and they come, right? She is desperate to exemplify her love, right? She likes to tell stories, right? And she is keenly aware of her position of being married to a great man of power, maybe the third or fourth most important man of all of Egypt, which is Potiphar. But she also wants to have her cake and eat it too, right? Well, she actually wants to buy it. She wants to bake it. She wants to cook it, decorate it, and eat it, and not share it with anybody. This is the character of this woman. It's all about me, right? Potiphar's wife. So one thing we should take note of is that she never refers to Joseph by name when you read the scriptural text. She refers to him as a Hebrew, right? Which is meant to degrade or to put down, to exonerate herself, that she is much bigger than he is and, and that this Hebrew servant deserves death for refusing her advances when you read this text. Powerful text, powerful, powerful text, right? So we learn about this woman, right? Through verses 17, seven through 19, it's all about Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife. So as we begin to unpack the event of the day, talking about these two characters, right? Do know that Joseph's life resembles, right? Uh, in, in a troubling kind of way, the life of, don't laugh, Forrest Gump, okay? No matter what happens in his life, it tends to be multiplied into something that he has no control over whatsoever. Don't laugh, all right? 
Every time Forrest Gump did something, right, it seemed like it, it multiplied. I mean, he went in to try playing table tennis and he went to the Olympics, right? He tried out for the Alabama uh, uh, football team and he, you know, ran all these touchdowns back, you know. I mean, they, they couldn't stop him because he ran so fast. And uh, he saved all these men in battle, you know. He put them on his shoulder and he saved like a whole platoon of men. I mean, everything he put his hands in, hands on, right, in difficult situations, in dark situations, God saw him through it. Right. And we wonder, wow, man, how could, how could he, you know, and then he's at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Right. And these people are speaking and and he actually gets the opportunity to get up and speak. And people can't hear what he's saying, but they hear the last few words of what he said. And he actually becomes a national hero because of that. As I digress. So that's the life of Joseph. Right. When we think about it, when we when we read the spiritual text, we're thinking, man, this is made for a movie. And there have been movies made about Joseph. Joseph is hated by his brothers. He is favored by his father, almost murdered by his brothers, right? Thrown into an empty well, brought to Egypt by the Midianites. The Midianites sold him to the Ishmaelites. He ends up working for Pharaoh's captain of the guard, which is Potiphar, which is where we're at today. And now this. Hmm. So no matter what happens, Kent, God is the one who is the reason for the outcome of all of our situations, right? That outcome always leading to the, the, to the, uh, uh, the continued indoctrination of God's people, right? And their journey to the promised land. We, there are difficult days ahead, continually. Even if everyone on the planet was vaccinated right now, and we are all able to go back out to restaurants and do everything we wanted to do, we are still going to have problems. God is orchestrating. He is testing us as he is testing, I'm getting ahead of myself, Joseph. Hmm. I was thinking about this as I digress once again. Think about this the other day. I was saying, when God sent these plagues upon Egypt, you know, he had told Moses, he's like, you know what? I'm, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. But do know that he's going to say no. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, why would you even tell Moses that? He's, that he has to just kind of go through the motions and, and be abrupt and say, you know, God said, let my people go, the great I am. And knowing that Pharaoh is going to say no. But anyway, how does that connect to what I'm trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that uh, God sent, you know, in, 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 in uncertain terms and these certain orders, he sent frogs and he sent, uh, uh, you know, he uh, put blood in, in the river Nile. He, uh, the locusts came and the, the hail came and the fire came. And, and it, can you think about that? I just want to think about this. If we don't cry out to God during these times, during these testing times, during a COVID time, right? During times of unrest, then you get a variant. You get something even more powerful, right? If you don't cry out to me, then all of the waters of Egypt will turn to blood. If you don't cry out to me, right, then the locusts will come and eat up all your food. If you don't cry out to me, right, fire will come. If you don't cry out to me, I will take your firstborn. If you don't cry out to me, if you don't adhere to what I am trying to do, because I am a loving God, but if you turn your back on me, I'm jealous. I'm going to take revenge in a loving kind of way. So we have to pay attention. And this is what's happening in our story today. This is God's people. Joseph represents God's people on this journey, right? Hmm. Think about it like this. Joseph is like the mustard seed of all of Israel. He is, the, he is, the, he, he is this long-growing mustard seed that's been planted, and God is nursing it. He is putting fertilizer around it, and he is watering it, right? Because he knows that one, at, at, at a certain point in time that because of what Joseph has done for, for the Hebrew people, the small segment of the Hebrew people, right, that a whole nation of two and three million people will grow because of what he has done. He is the mustard seed, right? God begins to, to fight off those things that could choke the nation, right? As I talked about the famine and the, the trajectory of getting Israel from the land of Canaan to Egypt. These are all challenges, right? Because when you read the scripture, you're thinking, how is Jacob and the rest of the brothers going to make it all the way down to Egypt, right? Where Joseph is, how can that happen? God had a plan, right? I'm going to send the famine. Hmm. But in the meantime, I'm going to continue to water and fertilize Joseph and get him ready, right? I want him to be in a position of power and authority, right? So he'd be able to feed everyone throughout the region. And then by chance, maybe uh, Jacob would turn to his sons and say, why are you standing there looking at me? Don't laugh. That's what scripture says. Why are you standing here looking at each other? Are we going to just watch each other die? Go down to Egypt and buy us some food. Hmm. 
So this is the trajectory of God is working, you know. It, it just seems so miraculous, right? But this is God, right? The famine, the, the trajectory of getting Israel from the land of Canaan to Egypt, right? And in the meantime, as we read the scriptural text, right, what we see is deception. We see reception, right? When Jacob, uh, Joseph finally sees his brother, we see his perception, right? Oh, I mean, he put the silver uh, in my packet. Why did he give you more than, than me, right? Rejection. We see aggression, right? Right? Go get your brother Benjamin. You know, he even knew what, who his brothers were. And salvation, right? Oh, and he cried out loud. I know I'm getting ahead of myself. So what do we take from this story today? All right? Well, God has a plan and it centers around Joseph. He is the centerpiece on the table because we do know that the faith of Joseph is the sustaining power that keeps him alive. He's by himself. How else could you make it to Hebrews 11, right? Now I'm really preaching. He, which is the exposition about the examples of, the, of faith expression, right? The effectiveness expression of faith. Joseph makes it to Hebrews. Not everybody makes it to the book of Hebrews, right? By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. This is what Joseph is doing, amen. Notwithstanding his favor with God, his, his love of God, right, his fear of God and how God is represented, right, in the family lineage, right? Joseph knows these things. He knows about Jacob. He knows about Abraham, Isaac, right? He, know, he knows about these things, right? Right? He's part of that lineage. He may not know how he fits into the equation, but he does know that if he, that if he never relinquishes, right, never gives up on the promise of God, right, and even though the false teachings and the idolatry and everything going on around him and people are trying to destroy him, that he will overcome. So this is where we're at today, to find strength and perseverance, all right? To find pleasure in knowing that God will persevere. He will allow us to persevere if we so al allow him to. He will be with us through these storms. Check this out. For the past several weeks and months, we've been having these conversations. We've been, uh, uh, you guys have been sitting in your living rooms or sitting with friends and family, and you've been listening to the word of God. And God has made a way out of no way in many occurrences and many, uh, many situations. Many of us have been affected with COVID and we've made it through, right? Our friends and loved ones. Some haven't made it, but, but we continue to what? Thank God. Hmm. As I digress once again for a moment, do know, I'm excited about this, this story, I, I know you see this. Do know that what we learn and take away and apply in life is but a reflection of what our parents and grandparents had to endure, right? Donnell, right? Classic example, 2 Timothy 1 and 5, Paul's conversation of faith with his young protege, Timothy, right? What does he say? When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. As I think about Charlotte Menace, and then not only Charlotte Menace, but her mother, right, you know, Miss Anderson, and I think about all these, these, these people that, that work their faith, that can continue to love their children and their grandchildren, and they continue to persevere until things got better. There's something about the faith DNA, is what I'm trying to tell you, the faith DNA, that if you are willing to explore and be a part of God's great mystery within his manifold sustaining power, right, we too can be strengthened by God's power. So Joseph is no exception. He doesn't live a life of fear, right? But a life of possibility, right? I can see this woman chasing him around the house. And that's what, and that's what it says that she was, she was actually chasing him around the house. And she grabbed him. She finally caught up with him and grabbed his cloak and said, lay with me, lie down with me. And he ran out of the house. This is nothing but a God wink, right? In every situation, give thanks to God for uh, the, the devil, the walls of the devil, because he is coming to kill, steal, and destroy. So how do you know that being cast out doesn't mean God is not working? This is a question to each one of us, right? That Joseph was cast out in many situations. And I'm sure at times, you know, he didn't waver from his faith as Abraham. He just went through the motions. As I stated, I gave my Forrest Gump. Uh, example how Forrest Gump never said, well, I'm just going to go on back to Alabama. He did that a few times, but it, but it was for a specific purpose and a reason. So how do we know that, that once we get away from the security and the protection of our friends and families and strangers in a strange land, that God doesn't have a purpose for you? When I moved to Nigeria, I did not speak the language, even though English was one of their languages. I did not speak Ibu. I didn't speak Hausa. I didn't speak Yoruba. 
And I definitely didn't look like I was from Nigeria, but I was accepted by, by people who truly loved me and appreciated me because of my belief in Jesus Christ. How do we know that taking an unusual class in school, right, to our children, doesn't and won't lead us to a place where that skill is needed the most? Have you ever, like, when you was in college or when you was in school, you know, your mother or your grandparents, take French, right? Take Spanish, take, uh, take this calculus class. And you go in there and you just barely pass it and you say, why did I take that? And then you find out five or six years later, they turn to you in an interview and say, can you do this calculus equation? We're looking for one person who can do it. Can you do it? And you're like, well, yes, I can do it. And you wonder, man, if it wasn't for my mother that told me to take that class, I wouldn't be here today. How do we know that losing a position, right, uh, that, that we hate won't lead us to a position or a place that we love, right? How, how do we know this? How, how do we know this? How, how do you know that, 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 that if you don't take time to fix that water leak, right, under the sink, right, that's been dripping, right, that, that, that if you don't fix it right now, it could save you and your entire home from being damaged or destroyed. I've got to fix that leak right now, right, while I am able. Because if I don't fix the leak right now, right, I may lose everything. So let me take $20 and fix the leak. Hmm. My point is, and this should be no surprise, that there are no safe places with God. We are not safe. God doesn't want us comfortable. If we get comfortable, right, if we don't have a thorn in our side, then we will not even praise him. We have to have a thorn in our side and see it through to the end. Whatever situation we're going through, that we see it through to the very end. And this is the story of Joseph, right? We have to exemplify and, and, and illuminate a special kind of light from God. That's why, uh, whether it was the, uh, the, uh, the Midianites or the Ishmaelites or the people of Egypt, everybody saw him. And then once he goes into prison, which we'll talk about next week, everybody just looked at this young man and said, you know what, I can trust him. That's the way we have to be as Christians. Hmm. We have to be prepared at all times not to fall apart, right? In cold, dark, damp places as I picture myself under the sink a few days ago. We have to find a piece of sanctity, right? A floating piece of, 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 of metal or a floating piece of something that we can hang on to, right? Grab hold on to while we can so we can survive this situation that we're going through, right? As I begin to close, I was reading a few passages, right? from Nelson Mandela last night, The Long Walk Home. Thick, thick book, beautiful book. And he quotes, he says, I have seen men and women risk and give their lives for an idea. I have seen men stand up to attacks and torture without breaking, showing a strength and resiliency that defies the imagination. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. I felt fear of myself more times than I can remember, but I hid behind a mask of boldness right? The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers the fear. He goes on to say that he never lost hope. Joseph is one who goes on, who doesn't let fear conquer him. He lives in hope. Hmm. So maybe this is what our story is about today, among other things. It's a, it's a story of a young man who was hated and despised by many throughout his lifetime but always found room, right, to hope and to love with a spirit of eagerness and compassion, right? We all have a loving obligation to our people in our community and to our country. This is something Nelson Mandela said as well. And how do we do that? We start with ourselves first. So this is the story of many believers today, wrongly accused, right? This is us as believers, right? We are persecuted and yet finding the will to utilize what light is given in a dark tunnel and the salvaging pieces of broken spirit that once kept us whole. What we do is as we continue to get beat up each and every day as these things keep coming upon us and falling upon us, right? Each and every day we are not, we are not, we always feel like we're not being protected or, or God is not with us. But, th but yet we wake up the next morning and we're like, what happened yesterday? We don't even remember because God made a way out of no way. Verse seven, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. There's none greater in this house, Joseph says, than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me, right? Because you are his wife, I cannot do this wickedness, right? And sin against God. Joseph, if you have noticed, is growing in spiritual maturity as I begin to close. This is a beautiful story. 
it's funny, right? If you read it, but when you start really, really reading it and applying it to your own life and to this nation being exposed and uncovered, it begins to make sense. We have a young man who is growing like a nation into maturity, right? And though he has been wrought with banishment and slavery, his spirituality and his relationship with God has been elevated in the darkest times of his life, right? And his relationship with God is, is continuing to grow, right? That, that all he has, all he knows he has is God, right? And it's repeated throughout chapter 39 that the Lord was with him. When he was taken into slavery and the Lord was with Joseph, with the Midianites and the Lord was with Ishmaelites and the Lord was with Potiphar's house and the Lord was with Joseph. So throughout scripture, there have been many battles fought. Get this, right? I'm gonna condense this now and, and, and really help myself understand it a little bit better as I close. In the Old Testament, we find many, many of these battles fought on the battlefield, right? Joshua, the great warrior, and he, he fought the battle of Jericho, right? This was a spiritual battle. And he also conquered the city of Ai and many other major cities. And in the New Testament, we find Jesus Christ. And he is fighting battles in the wilderness and he is convincing unbelievers of who he is. And Jesus fought battles in the synagogues and he was debating and winning the text and the spiritual battles of heaven and earth. This is our Jesus Christ. These are the battles that he fought. And we later find Paul fighting against the Greek religious institutions of idols and, and, and at the churches of Ephesus and Philippi and, and Colossians and Corinth and Paul fights as the last living witness to have seen Christ and he testifies to the truth that Jesus Christ from Nazareth is the son of the living God. That was the battle he was fighting and that the laws of Moses have value but won't get you salvation. Paul exclaims, you must go through Christ. That is the only way that you will make it to salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but, but that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the rulers, right? Of darkness, right? Of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high and elevated places is what we're wrestling against. And that's what Joseph was wrestling against, spiritual wickedness in high places. And we find Jesus fighting battles, right? And, and he's winning these battles. Why? Because he is God. So this is what Joseph was up against, not only a physical battle, right? When you slowly read these three verses, in Genesis 39. No matter how hot the furnace, God will be with you, right? He's a, but, but, but do know this, that, that, that Joseph is, is fighting this. Uh, it's a physical battle as I digress, right? It's, it's a physical battle, not a, not a spiritual battle per se, but it's a, it's, a physical, it's a physical battle and a spiritual battle that Joseph is fighting. So in layman's terms, Joseph's life is about a test. Our lives are being tested, as I stated. So now God is asking us on this day, how do you respond when the world has turned against you and will you trust in me, right? So Joseph's battle was not on the battlefield, right? It was in the bedroom. And it was a physical battle between spiritual wickedness in high places. So no matter how big the battlefield, Satan is always attacking you, and it's up to us to stand firm in the truth and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. God is with us, right? This is what this new nation was up against as we uncover this nation. God was testing Joseph as an individual. This is true. But he was also testing the commitment and the resolve of a new nation, right? That he could see on the edge of the horizon. Hmm. It's a powerful story. And as I stated, as, as funny as it is, right, how this woman who, and we've seen it in Hollywood movies where uh, someone is chasing a young man, right? Maybe it's Dustin Hoffman, for example. But a young man has been, he's being chased and, and the, the older woman wants him because she has power and authority and, and position, right? And he refuses the advances and he gets punished for it. This is what happens to Joseph. And what we'll learn next week is that it cost him many years of peace. They actually put him in prison because of this. But do know this, right? There are two types of prison or three or four types of prison, but I would not want to be in prison in Egypt during this time. 
the scripture goes on to say, and I want you to keep this in mind, Potiphar didn't believe his wife. When he came home and, and Potiphar's wife says, the Hebrew boy, he tried to take advantage of me. He tried to lie with me and this, this, this. Potiphar had to do something. But do know this. It says in the scripture, if you read it slow, right, that Joseph was put in the basement of Potiphar's house. There was a prison. Now, I don't want to say a basement like in your house because Potiphar had, I'm sure, a mansion of some sorts where there might have been 20 or 30 cells in a certain attachment of his house. So this is where Joseph is because we later find, right, we find this, the chief butler, right, and the chief chef, right, who are actually uh, under Pharaoh are thrown into the same prison. So this is a white collar prison. And wouldn't you guess that even in prison, God says, I am with you. And even though he has to go through this storm, God brings him out of that storm and elevates him to a much higher level. He actually gets a chariot next to Pharaoh's chariot in the end, but we'll get into that next week. So I just want you to keep in mind throughout the week or as you read Genesis 39, how God is blessing this young man and how God will bless us even through difficult circumstances, right? We feel that our circumstances have nothing to compare to Joseph, right? That, that, that whatever Joseph went through, my situation and my issues, my mental health, my family issues are much bigger than Joseph. Oh, how many of us have been thrown into a dry well, right? How many of us have had brothers and sisters who went to, went to the father with, with, with blood from a lamb or from a goat and said, your son is dead? How many of us have been sold into slavery twice, how many of us have been sold to and, and, and end up in another, in a foreign land where you don't even speak the language? How many of us, how, how many times has that happened to us, right? The night is far spent. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Amen. Powerful story. May God continue to bless each and every one of us. Do know that this was a test. And each and every day, us as believers and even those who are struggling in the faith are being tested day in and day out. But keep pointing towards the light. And I know I used it as a reference a few moments ago about the sink. I had a drip in my sink, in one of the bathroom sinks. It was dripping, dripping, dripping. It's been dripping for a long time, but it got worse. And it was time to finally fix it. But do know this, as I was placed in a vulnerable position on my back, right? I would not be able to make those repairs without light. Because if I went under the sink without any light whatsoever, I would not be able to see and be able to make those repairs that were necessary, right? To keep my house on top of water, amen. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end. Amen, amen, and amen. May God continue to bless you throughout this week, throughout this day. Um, Bless not only your families and your communities, your, your children, your grandchildren, your, uh, uh, and, and all those that you, that, you, that you work with, and even, your, even your, uh, your enemies. Bless them. You know, may God bless them as well. And let's continue to continue to keep praying for one another, right? And do know that we have to uh, find a way, right, to, to begin to wipe away, right, the scales from our eyes so that we may see clearly what God is trying to illustrate and show us. And I know I use that as an example, right, about the variant. But keep in mind, how do we know that's not how God works? That if you are not doing the will of God, I'm going to send something even more powerful. If you're not doing common sense type things like wipe it, washing your hands or wearing a mask, right, or, or staying at home or, or social distancing, if, if you're not doing things that make sense, right, because our lives are precious. Our lives are so, so very precious. And we cannot continue to just take advantage and think because 
they're not doing it, so I'm not going to do it. But what about the people who love you? What if they lose you because of your foolishness or your, or your selfishness? Let's preserve life is all I'm saying. Do everything you can to preserve life and be a light to all those who are not following or adhering to what makes sense. So may God continue to bless each and every one of you. I love you. And I hope to see you next week, if it be God's will, as James says. Take care. I love you. Bye-bye. Winnie, nice to see you, my cousin. Wanda, nice seeing you. I see all of my cousins. So may God bless you and keep every last one of you. Take care. I love you. Stay in touch.